respected teachers colleagues and students a warm good morning to all let me first wish you all a happy independence day as our nation is celebrating its 75th year of independence on behalf of kerala orthodontic study group i extend a hearty welcome to all participants to the first webinar of kosg the orthodontic summit today we are honored to have the honorable president of indian orthodontic society dr silju mathew sir amongst us as the chief guest i welcome you sir we also have dr sri devi padmanabhan the honorable secretary of indian orthodontic society is amongst us i welcome you ma'am and uh, we have a lot of dignitaries also and i welcome all of them and all the participants to this webinar a little bit of background on how the idea of this webinar evolved into a reality kvsg has a very active and vibrant whatsapp group where many orthodontists who are posting excellent clinical cases most of the time and uh, some of them have some excellent biomechanics and we all were all struck by the record they were displaying so one fine day dr silju sir suggested the idea that the indian orthodontic society will provide the zoom platform if we can organize a webinar so that these enthusiastic orthodontists work will reach a wider audience and it will benefit the student community of the ios at large so uh, we thank dr silju sir for that uh, the thread of wisdom which has sparked us to come up with this webinar this is our first webinar uh, as a, as we all know that most of the people during this covid are dragged down by the zoom fatigue we thought like uh, this is an excellent uh, way of getting back some audience who might have experienced some zoom fatigue so here we are with the kosg webinar so without much ado let us move on to the proceedings of the day today we have scheduled three events first is a lecture by dr srijit kumar sir professor and hod government dental college about diagnostic uh, criteria for orthognathic surgery patients then we have a book release two of the staff of the government dental college calicut has come up with the handbook of preclinical orthodontics under the tutelage and the able leadership of dr shobha sundaresh because we all know that ma'am was consistent and persistent in elevating the department of orthodontics in calicut to the lofty heights so these two uh, young staff at government dental college to and uh, calicut has been a catalyst for mams uh, aspirations so that will be the second thing and third we have the most exciting event of what we aptly titled orthodontic pearls where our two brilliant young orthodontists will showcase some of their clinical excellence and experience during the course of these lectures if any delegate has any doubts or questions they can type the same in the chat box now i request dr prashant pradap convener of kerala orthodontic study group to introduce the first speaker of the day good morning and happy independence day respected president of the indian orthodontic society dr silju mathew respected secretary of the indian orthodontic society dr shri devi my uh, kosc co conveners my seniors and my colleagues actually dr srijit kumar he doesn't need an introduction in this platform but nevertheless it's my duty to introduce him he holds the position of the professor and head of the department of department government dental college trivandrum as of now he graduated from gdc trivandrum in 18, 1989 and he finished his post graduation from gdc trivandrum in the year 1994 he entered into government service at uh, government dental college calicut and in the year 1997 as senior lecturer he served as the orthodontic teaching faculty in almost all the dental colleges government dental colleges in the state he has over 27 years of clinical experience and 24 years of uh, teaching 
experience. His areas of interest are clinical orthodontics, dentofacial orthopedics, functional appliances, cleft lip and palate, and orthodontic biomechanics. He has many national as well as international publications, and uh, he's uh, and has de delivered various lectures on functional appliances, orthopedic appliances, bracket positioning, and biomechanics. At present, he is a member review board of Journal of Indian Orthodontic Society. He is a reviewer of World Federation of Orthodontics. He is a member PG Board of Studies at Kerala University of Health Sciences. He is a past member of uh, Faculty of Dentistry, University of Kerala, past member of Faculty of Dentistry, University of Calicut, past member of Faculty of Dentistry, MG University Kottayam, past member of Faculty of Dentistry, Kerala University of Health Science, UG. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Prashant, for the introduction. I'll share my screen first. Before I start my proceedings today, I would like to express my sincere appreciation as well as thanks to the Honorable President, Indian Orthodontic Society, Dr. Silju Mathi, sir, Honorable Secretary, Dr. Sridevi Parmaham, Madam, Executive Members, Conveners of Kerala Orthodontic Study Group, dear Dr. Prashant, Dr. Deep Leander, Dr. Hashim, for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge a little bit what I can say about surgical orthodontics in this orthodontic summit. So, the surgical orthodontics, we all know that this is especially uh, uh, in relation to skeletal malocclusions. We all know that skeletal malocclusions is one of the important uh, malocclusion or anomaly, which we all know encountered, and it is also a challenging malocclusion or dentofacial, dentofacial problem, which we all encounter, especially orthodontists as well as oral surgeons. So today I'm going to deal or, or speak about surgical orthodontics, its diagnostic as well as treatment considerations, including some of the recent developments which have occurred in recent years in technology as well as in treatment procedures, and also in, in the treatment execution. So we all know the prevalence of, of malocclusion, especially dental malocclusions, which occurs in different ethnic groups, is varying. It is having a gross diversity across different ethnic, ethnic groups. And it comprises of about 67 for class, 68 in class one, as well as 20, nearly 21 percentage in class two and in 7.2 percentage in classroom malocclusions worldwide. But if you see India, there is hardly any data available, but depends based on the available data, which is now here, the dental class two, class one comprises of almost 20 to 43 percentage, and class two comprises of 27 to 28 percentage, class three again comprises of 12 to 13. These are dental malocclusions. So if you're coming to skeletal malocclusion city, it is only up to two to three percentage of the total population. So that is what the little bit evidence which is saying about the prevalence of this malocclusion in our country. So we all know that the limitation of, of movement of tooth along with bone in all three planes of space within the biological limits or constraints is clearly illustrating by the envelope discrepancy. So based on this, Orthodontics is having a limited uh, uh, capacity or limited amount of movement in all three planes of space. Next comes orthodontics as well as orthopedics using, using functional orthopedics as well as other uh, orthopedic devices. Then skeletal anchorage devices, it's a new introduction in orthodontics. So in, in borderline cases as well as uh, borderline skeletal uh, malocclusion cases can be treated or well managed by this modality. And the major movement can be achieved only by surgical orthodontics or orthodontic surgical procedures. 
So when you're coming to the diagnosis as well as treatment planning, so uh, unlike all other orthodontic problems, surgical orthodontic surgical cases or skeletal malabsorptions can we have a specific modality or way of diagnosing as well as or or eliciting the different clinical as well as other findings and executing the plan. So for that, you need to have a close collaboration or close association with the oral surgeon from the day on. on that, mean, that means the day on, on, you see the patient, that day onwards, you should have a close association with the oral surgeon. In each and every stage of the treatment, you should have this association. Otherwise, you are, you are prone, because ultimately, in between, you have to change the plan. Sometimes you have to change the, your, your, your mode of treatment. Sometimes your movement of tooth. Sometimes you have to modify. So all these things has to be considered. In that way, you should have a close collaboration or association with the maxillofacial surgeon. So these are the things. To, so today, I'm, I'm going to speak only about conventional orthodontics. We all know that the recent uh, in surgical orthodontics is surgery first approach. So that is not I'm going to talk today just because of the time constraints. So I'm cons giving an overview only about the conventional uh, uh, surgical orthodontics. So in that, the diagnosis is always starting with clinical examination, radiographic examination using different cephalometric analysis. So 2D as well as 3D evaluation, again, two dimensional cephalometrics as well as 3D evaluation as well as uh, virtual setup of the patient. 2D and 3D treatment simulations. So effectively execute the treatment plan or plan the, the, plan the treatment. You have to have a treatment simulation device which can be done in two dimensionally as well as in three dimensionally. Pre-surgical orthodontics, mural surgery and splint fabrication, surgery proper and post-surgical orthodontics, and, and obviously the finishing. So these are the things which is has to be done in, in, in conventional surgical orthodontic cases. So in, regarding the, the diagnostic, diagnostic aspect, decision-making process is very, very critical. So uh, as I told you earlier, unlike conventional orthodontics in surgical orthodontic cases, so nowadays the the, the decision making is mainly or the treatment plan decision making is mainly because of uh, or based on a shared decision making. Shared decision ma making means you have to share the the different inf information relating to the problem or the problem list, what plan you are going to have or what is the ultimate outcome. All these things you have to share with your pa your patient. So that is why it is called shared decision making. So previously there was a tendency which is which we call which we say in, in paternalism versus patient autonomy, which has been clearly um, illustrating in problem oriented approach. In way in in this we all know that the the operator or the surgeon or the orthodontist acts like a dictator and he decides things, and patient ha has to simply accept this. So now this is no more. A, 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 a criteria now. So again, goal-oriented approach, again, by Sauber has put up, put forward this thing. And he says that, again, patient's positive attributes has to be uh, looked into and that has to be taken into consideration. And other things, you can you can omit it or you can you can accept it if you want. In that way, it is going. So now the, the trend is shifting to, to an area or, or or situation where the patient needs experience and their priorities has to take into consideration as for that you have to give the the primary consideration so in that way the problem list or problems has to be created in two ways objective as well as in subjective ways so the objective is objective problem list are dental you know that the operator or the or the or the or the orthodontist or the or, or surgeon they will formulate a problem list depends on the different problems of the teeth or the bone or aesthetic problem or functional problem. So these are the pro problem lists which is created by the operator. That means it is called objective problem list. Now the other thing which is called the, the patient related to uh, problems. So that means patient expectations as well as concerns. So a patient may have aesthetic perceptions for how they look like and how what are their perceptions about, about, about facial beauty and all these things you have to take into consideration. They must be having speci special needs for their for their uh, uh, treatment to be executed or their face to be become or choices especially realism is an important aspect in, in this way you have to you have to take into consideration realism means nothing but uh, many patients will 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 say or will have a feeling that my face should appear after surgery my face should appear 
almost like some of the rural modes like some actresses or actors so that that way that way it is not possible to have it so that means it is called realism as far as operator is concerned you should not give over expectation or over promise to the patient that i can change your face like anything like a like a model or like an actor film actor or actress that should not be given so that means over promise or over expectation should not be given to the patient so, so all these aspects has to be very very clear so that is why it is called the 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 objective problem list is by the operator and the patient expectation is by the patient now if you are coming to the clinical examination proper it is the clinical assessment or clinical or facial analysis so the, for the for that the patient has to be sit in natural head, natural head position like in all orthodontic diagnostic procedure or clinical examination this is the way assess the apical bases you have to assess the apical bases according to conventional ways as well as newer ways that i'll i'll come to it dental compensations we all know that majority of skeletal malocclusions have a dental compensatory mechanism in all planes of space in anteroposterior vertical as well as transverse plane of space you have dental compensations to mask the original skeletal discrepancy so that has to be find out aesthetic issues many patients will be having aesthetic issues relating to skeletal malocclusion that also has to be um, taken care of smile features and functional problems especially when when the jaws the maxilla as well as mandible is not positioned correctly patient may be having functional problems so that also has to be addressed and that has to be documented soft tissue limitations so some of the skeletal malocclusions with your treatment or without your treatment they will be having some soft tissue limitation that means they will be having attached gingiva as well as gingiva problems periodontal problems as well as other perioral muscular problems all these things has to be taken into consideration so regarding the 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 facial uh, examination on the frontal view so right from the very beginning sarkas has introduced the the different uh, facial width as well as height ratios in relation to uh, face for optimum facial this thing so 1.35 to 1, 1 is the ratio for males that means for for width as well as height so height has to be 1.3 and width has to be 1 for males and for female the height has to be 1.3 and it is one is should be the width so that means the height as well as width ratio and for bi temporal width it should be 80 to 85 five percentage of the bi zygomatic width that means between the zygomatic prominence that is bi zygomatic width from that it is should be the bi temporal width should be on the forehead on side of forehead should be 80 to 80.85 percentage bi zygomatic width should be 70 percentage of the vertical height so that means for total vertical height mi uh, minus 30 percent that means 70 percent should be the bi zygomatic width of the face this is considered to be ideal and bi gonial width should be 30 percent less than bi zygomatic width so in that way facial forms as well as facial set can also be evaluated and symmetry we all know that symmetry can be assessed by by joining the lines certain points and forehead labella uh, dorsum uh, dorsum of the nose nasal tip columella of the nose sorry uh, uh, philtrum of the um, uh, lips as well as lips and menton so these are the points by connecting these points you have a symmetric face we all know that nobody is having absolutely symmetrical faces so that means some amount of asymmetry is considered to be normal so when you have a patient with facial asymmetry if you see that if you joining these three po these points you will see that majority of the times the lower uh, uh, face or the lower third will be diverted or mentone will be diverted towards one side or the other side in those cases which are having asymmetry only those asymmetry has to be recorded and that has to be documented so this is one of the one of the uh, uh, analysis or it is one of the analysis to see the facial asymmetry if if pathology is noticing it is by it is popularly called the tml system so tml system is mentone and transverse plane and and the cant of the maxillary plane and the lip or cant of lip that has to be documented so this system it will document especially the lower third of face if there is a canting or there is a asymmetry of the lower third the system can be used 
So transverse proportion, I am not going to the details of this thing. I think everybody is aware of this thing. Vertical proportion, this is very, very important. So majority of the problems, as we know that this is occurring in the middle as well as lower third of the face. So in skeletal malocclusions, it is so particular that in, in, in middle third of the face, sometimes if you have a short middle third, so you have the typical appearance of uh, recessive, um, recessive nose as well as paranasal hollowing as well as loss of loss of decrease vertical height of the middle middle one third, and especially in lower uh, one third, if it is less, that you will have decreased uh, um, lower lower face height as well as deep endolipid sulcus and intra you can see deep uh, deep bite also. So these are the you see when you have a, when you have a, uh, a documentation of vertical facial proportions using lines or these facial one third. So there is a problem with this uh, uh, with this mode of um, mode of evaluation. So the thing is, as we all know that the the different facial structures, upper facial upper facial third, lower middle middle as well as lower facial thirds are interconnected. So uh, suppose if the middle one third if you have a problem that can be influenced in the lower third also. So that means if you have a lower lower third issue that can be uh, very well influenced on the upper third also. That means all these thirds are interconnected. So that means there is a markation or demarcation between these lines is not adequate according to Rene K. S. L. in the study. So for that, what they said was they dividing into zones of influence. So that means they are dividing the face into four different, not four, in fact, five different segments. So they said it is the forehead zone. So oculo nasal zone, this zone which comprises the maxilla is called the maxillary natic zone. And the zone which comprises the mandibular zone is the mandibular natic zone. And the lowermost zone, which is called the genial zone, which is the chin area. So that means any deviation in any of these areas can be influenced by other. That means the zonal zone of influence can be taken as an appropriate mode of evaluating vertical proportion that is according to Reneke. Obviously, smile evaluation has to be done. You have to see the amount of visibility of incisor, maybe approximately three to four incis millimeter of incisor tip has to be visible during rest as well as the smile arc has to be maintained. Buckle corridor, if there is any excess buckle, buckle corridor or increase in dark space or negative space that has to be taken care of and has to be documented. And some sort of expansion in the maxillary arch or transverse correction has to be done in the maxilla to correct it. Or if there is, if sometimes you have a, a, a third order expression on the posterior, that also has to be correct to, to effectively correct the dark space. Now from frontal view, there is another uh, thing which has to be monitored is the scleral show as well as paranasal hollowing. Majority of the class three malocclusions, skeletal class three malocclusions will be having a paranasal hollowing as well as scleral visibility, which shows typically a maxillary or maxillary hypoplasia or deficiency. So that has to be documented. Cheekbone contour line. This is another thing. This was proposed initially proposed by Arnold uh, for his spatial analysis. So this is one of the one of the parameters to see the normal relationship between cheekbone, axilla, and and nose. So this has to be. This is a smooth curve. This is almost an S-shaped curve, which is coming from the cheekbones, and it is going uh, below uh, the cheekbones, and it is curving around the corners of the mouth of the lips. So if in a normally uh, having a normal proportion, all these things, all these curves should be maintained. In those cases where you have a mid-face retrusion, the cheekbone area will be having a flattening and patients will be having a class three prognathic mandible. Again, the lower portion will be having a flattening. This S side, S shaped curve may not be there. Now regarding the profile assessment, this is, these are the few ways we can assess the profile of the patient by constructing a facial plane angle, by dropping a line from uh, a, a perpendicular uh, to the FH plane from point N to Pogonion. So majority of the times this should be either 90 degree or just below the, the, the Pogonion point, Pogonion will be slightly behind or on the, on the line. So if that is so, that is correct. If the line is too much behind, it can be taken as a, as a, class, a class two profile. Or if it 
the line if it is chin is too much in front of this it can be taken as the uh, uh, class ray profile and profile angle again as proposed by uh, arnett you have two lines which is coming from uh, the the glabella to the subnasal and from subnasal to progodion if the norm, normal angle is 165 to 175 if it is decreasing that means it is becoming a convex that means below 165 it is a convex profile and above and and it is above that above 175 it is showing a class three profile that means it is becoming a concave profile so these are some of the methods now again facial contour angle Facial contour angle can be constructed by three points. You construct three points on the glabella, subnasal, again, uh, pogonion. So you draw a straight line from the glabella to subnasal, another line from subnasal to pogonion. You see the angle. The upper angle has to be taken. So normally, minus 14 should be the, the normal value. Minus 14 means if the, the lower angle is going ahead of the uh, upper uh, angle, up, Upper means the, the, the line which is connecting glabella to subnasal, then it is minus. So if the line is behind this thing, it's behind the nasion, um, sorry, behind the glabella and subnasal, it is uh, concave. So that means depends on that, the depends on the facial contour angle, you can analyze the patient whether it is concave, convex, or straight. Especially for lower face. The relation between the lips and, and chin can be identified by S line as proposed by uh, Ricketts. In normal cases, the upper lip will be four millimeter and the lower lip will be just touching or two millimeter behind. So it depends on that the cheek relation has to be, cheek as well as lip relation has to be seen. Nasolabial angle, again, these are the normal values proposed by Reneke, 85 to um, 110 and mentolabial, mentolabial angle or mentolabial sulcus angle, it is again 120, nearly 120 degrees. Nasal features. So nasal features, the length of the uh, doors of the nose as well as the projection has to be seen. In normal length of the nose, this is according to Goody's method, the method which was proposed by Goody. So Goody's method proposes the length of the uh, uh, nasal nasal uh, nasal dorsum should be 55 to 60 percent greater than the projection. So that means the nasal projection should be 55 to 60 percent less. So this is the the method proposed by Goody. As well as the there is another proportion which is proposing is that tip to alar alar or alar to uh, columella it should be uh, this to one that means it should be equal and columella to lobule. The length of columella to the, the, the nasal lobule should be two is to one ratio. And if you see from bottom, the LR base should be in a triangular shape. Chin lip distance, the distance between chin and lower lip. So this distance should be approximately, approximately half one is to one ratio, but certain other books, especially, uh, Certain other authors, especially Arnold, telling that this is should be one third to two third. That means the mentolabial subtone up to the mentolabial sulcus, it should be from stomium to um, mentolabial sulcus, it should be one third, and from mentolabial sulcus to lower border of chin, that is menton, should be two third. Anyway, this has to be documented. Chin throat angle, this is very, very important as far as the lower uh, face is concerned or chin is concerned. So the chin throat length should be approximately 40 or 40 plus or minus 5 for males as well as female. For female males, it should be slightly higher. And the chin throat angle should be approximately 110. So in class 3 cases, the, the, the chin throat length will be more and the angle will be acute. You can see here, here a class 2 case where you have a, a obtuse angle chin throat angle is acute or obtuse or increased, whereas in class three mandibular proconism, you have a acute angle. But if generally, if this is a case, see this case, we know that the, we know that the chin throat length is smaller 
as well as chin throat chin throat angle is uh, smaller in class 3 cases so look at this case he is having a mandibular prognathism uh, with a class 3 profile anyway he is having a concave profile as well as class 3 profile his chin throat length is less so that means this is a typical character of class 2 profile and if you see the angle again it is increased obtuse so that means this his chin is showing a class 2 class 2 chin so that means angle is increased the the chin uh, throat length is also uh, decreased so in such cases if you if you have if you go for a uh, correction class 3 correction using uh, bss setback or something like that the what is not going to happen is the chin will appear too recessive as well as it appears to be a recessive chin recessive chin as well as a double chin certain cases a bssso setback is contraindicated so in such cases there are only two options either you go for maxillary advancement or you go for if at all you wanted to do something on the mandible you go for a subapical osteotomy of the mandible that means segmental osteotomy of the mandible don't set back the mandible too much so that will create a double chin appearance so this is an exception for cephalometric evaluation we have lot of composite analysis uh, uh, that is what we do routinely here so along the standard uh, analysis is cox analysis both soft tissue as well as hard tissue analysis proposed by burson and legan and soft tissue analysis again are the proposed analysis is for especially for surgical cases there is an analysis analysis proposed by Arnett. prediction of surgical outcome so what are the different methods by which you can predict surgical outcome so this is one of the earliest uh, prediction methods uh, using 2d images that means cephalometric prediction it was introduced by cohen and later uh, it was it was uh, modified by lot of other people computer cephalometric predictions other thing computer 3d prediction again has come photo cephalometric prediction called video imaging 3d surgical predictions so so this is the this is the recent one 3d surgical prediction is the latest in prediction of surgical outcome so this can be precisely or correctly predict a surgical treatment before treatment so sto prediction that is the conventional one which which we are which we are doing two methods tracing overlay and template methods this is the conventional methods so as actually tracing methods tracing overlay methods you have to do in two times that means one is before treatment this is for diagnosis as well as treatment planning and for decision making so once you do the diagnosis or once you do the treatment planning appropriate prediction tracing can be done this can be show, shown to the patient and you can have a discussion with the patient regarding the treatment outcome using the predict, using the prediction tracing so this is for these two purposes only now there is another uh, sto prediction tracing this is pre surgical this is immediately after uh, immediately before surgery that means immediately after pre surgical orthodontic so this is used for the use as the guide for the surgeon to how much the mandible or maxilla can be moved to get the optimum results so this is used as a guide and this can be used as a guide for mock surgery for how much millimeter the maxilla or mandible can move in different planes of space so this is a this is just an example uh, i am showing a case which has done for uh, prediction method leaf out on this patient is having a class 2 Uh, skeletal malocclusion vertical growth pattern increase in incisor visibility as well as gummy smile so you have planned for leaf out on superior impaction 6 mm so auto rotation and along with that aim anterior maxillary osteotomy 4 mm and just because patient is having a vertically growing patient long face a lower border reduction genioplasty also considered so this is the initial tracing now you you go for the the maxillary uh, tracing you go for the uh, vertical positioning impaction 6 mm impaction 
so in this case we have not gone for uh, the the traditional uh, impaction not uh, any not not we didn't go for any differential uh, impaction traditional equal on posterior as well as anterior region 6 6 mm so when you go for 6 mm naturally the mandible will auto rotate you have a clockwise rotation of mandible sorry anti clockwise rotation of mandible again 4 mm uh, uh, setback or amo anterior maxillary osteotomy so this is the final result so this is the initial uh, tracing and this is the final tracing so this tracing can be shown to the patient and have a discussion on that for decision making whether it is acceptable or not if it is acceptable we can proceed with the treatment this is just for uh, for uh, okay there is another thing using using uh, 3d images especially cbct images there is another uh, prediction method which is now popular is sto that is subjective treatment object so this is another uh, uh, computerized uh, prediction method using cbct images of the patient so this using this thing you can precisely uh, uh, precisely position the maxilla or mandible water but in this case it is a mandibular prognosis so that means you can precisely position the mandible to the appropriate position this is not the conventional way of of whether cohen and all are proposed the 2d prediction for the sublimitary prediction so this is based on the uh, based on the method of orienting the chin to the upper face then you position the teeth as well as bones accordingly so initially you orient the chin to the fore, to the forehead as well as upper face then you do the correction of the of the compensation of the teeth both upper as well as teeth for optimizing this uh, result so that means soft tissue correct correct first then you position the hard tissue then you correct the decompensation so this is the correct method of uh, prediction using 3d superimposition i'll just have a small uh, uh, overview about the 3d evaluation also so i'm not very very familiar with this technique but i am i have with my limited knowledge i'll tell you so first uh, uh, the you have to do a cbct uh, image of the heart tissues especially the skull mandible maxilla as well as dentition so using a high resolution cbct you have to take the uh, images of the skull or heart tissues skull maxilla mandible as well as dentition that is the first procedure and second thing is using 3d cameras especially like stereo photographic cameras uh, you have to take a soft tissue picture in in two or three three different positions or three different angulations you can take maybe in in frontal on lateral one and oblique position you can take so in all these planes any number of planes or positions or angulations you can take this uh, uh, 3d camera photographs you can take and then you can take the uh, uh, model so that means scanning of the model has to be done either you can take it from uh, intraorally or the best method is that you have to take the uh, the method which is which is doing using models but what actually is the problem is when you take the uh, intraoral pictures there is a problem with occlusion so the occlusal relation has to be established first that means you have to take a white registration first with the white registration you take the occlusal contacts between maxillary and mandibular dentition you take that first record record it first using uh, either a laser scanning or high resolution cbct uh, images then you take the dentition in occlusion so that means you have you have to get the images of cbct uh, images of the, the heart tissues then you take the uh 3d cameras using the facial uh, uh, soft tissue structures as well including skin then you take the laser scanning of the dentition including occlusion that has to be taken so once you take that the different this is the, the typical picture of the heart tissue uh, image you, you have you have taken using cbct this is the in in right side occlusion as well as the condylar region and once that is done in the original uh, heart tissue data or heart tissue image you incorporate the uh, the the 
the scan which is obtained on the dentition. That means you can integrate this, the image of the uh, models on the CBCT picture of the mandible. So you can integrate and incorporate it. And once you are done on maxilla as well as mandible, you get a uh, virtual uh, patient model. So once the virtual patient model is obtained, you plan the surgery and accordingly you cut the uh, different, again, custom uh, osteotomy it depends on the patient or individual patient, you modify the uh, osteotomy size or plan it and you can do it. So this is the final superimposition based on that. So this is the 3D uh, evaluation as well as pre-surgical preparation for uh, um, using 3D images. Okay, now we'll come to the diagnostic considerations. So certain aspects has to be uh, very well documented in surgical cases, especially dental compensations. And second is you have to differentiate between surgical and non-surgical cases. Sometimes we may get some borderline surgical cases. We have a confusion whether it has to go for surgical correction or it has to go for an, or can be treated with uh, non-surgical correction to, to get some optimum orthodontic outcome. So you have to consider about cost versus benefit interest. The functional considerations, especially upper airway, especially in surgical cases, there is a problem. When you set back the mandible in class three cases, or in those cases, initially you have class two cases, the recipient mandible patient may be having a lot of functional issues. So that has to be taken care of and addressed. Unfavorable facial growth pattern. Many of the cases having unfavorable growth pattern, especially high angle cases, long face cases with class two as well as class three cases, you have a problem. So that has to be taken care of. Now, another, another trend which is coming nowadays is patient-centered outcome. So now the, the trend as far as the recent time, till the recent time, the outcome which was measuring through the operator only, that is why I, previously I said it is the objective problems. So now the, when patients are also involved, their outcome has also been documented. So lastly, stability of the treated cases, including soft tissue involvement, periodontal apparatus as well as TMJ considerations. So regarding dental compensations in anteroposterior plane, mainly the incisor inclination, axial inclination of incisor has to be considered. Vertical plane, again, incisors and posteriors. Transverse plane, again, the anteriors as well as posterior plane has to be documented. So in majority of the anteroposterior skeletal malocclusion, in class two as well as class three, you have different anteroposterior compensations. Regarding these two cases, in which case you go for surgical, in which case you go for uh, non-surgical treatments. You have a confusion. We, all, we can easily say that both patients are having a recessive mandible with a class two, uh, class two as well as a convex profile. So which cases you treat orthodontically and which case you treat orthodontic. So is there any, any method to see that? There is a, a study which is proposed by Profit et al. They say for class two malocclusion, these are the limits. So if overjet is more than 10 millimeter, you have to consider a surgical correction. This is less than 10 millimeter overjet, you can consider non-orthodontically, non including conventional orthodontics as well as the orthodontic treatment using temporary anchor devices. Another, uh, another uh, parameter which he says is in perpendicular supergonium. If it is more than 80 millimeter, the case has to be considered for a surgical correction. Mandibular body length, if it is less than 70 millimeter, the case again has to be considered uh, for uh, mandibular surgical mandibular advancement to increase the body length and face height if more than 125 uh, millimeter again you have to consider for surgical correction now regarding dental compensations in class 2 malocclusion in in class 2 surgical skeletal malocclusion so these are some of the typical situations you see so in upper anterior in class 2 uh, skeletal malocclusion. Typically, you see a retroclusion of the upper incisors to mask the original uh, deformity or original problem. Whereas in the lower anteriors, you see a compensate retroclination. So, and in the lateral upper uh, posteriors, the arches will be constricted. And the lower, again, it is, see, why it is happening is in typically in class two cases, the, the, the maxilla is occluding with the most of the anterior part of the lower dentition. 
So that is why this compensatory mechanism is occurring. So when the mandible is going back, naturally the tongue will accept a pressure from inside and the lower lip will have a proclined effect. In vertical plane, you have an extrusion of the lower anteriors. In majority of the cases, you see the lower arch will be having a lower occlusal plane, you having an exogenous thoracoscopy and you have an extrusion of the lower anteriors. Sometimes you have an extrusion of the anteriors also. Regarding class three cases, between surgical and non-surgical treatment, there is again a dilemma. In certain borderline cases, again, you'll be having a dilemma in, in whether you can treat this case successfully with, or, with orthodontics alone or this case has to go for a surgery. Again, there is a couple of studies. Keratol, as proposed in surgical cases, the ANB should be less than minus four degrees. And IMB should be less than 80, 83 degrees. If the IMB or lower incisor inclination is less than 83 degrees, you have to go for a surgical correction. Maxillary mandibular ratio, if it is more than 0.84, that has to be considered for a surgical correction. Hold away angle, again, it should be less than 3.5. So if all these factors are, are there, then the case has to be considered for a surgical correction. If otherwise, you can consider this case as a non-surgical treatment. Now, regarding dental compensations, if you see majority of the cases of skeletal class 3 with mandibular uh, prognathism as well as mandibular deficiency, this is the thing you see. The tongue will be placed, uh, you can see the tongue, it will be seen more anteriorly. So that means this will accept a pressure on the upper anteriors that will produce an open bite as well as proclination of the upper incisors. And the lower major, many situations, the lower occlusal plane will be flat and you have proclined upper incisors and you have a transverse width. It is not actually increasing, but the thing is buccal flaring of molars or posterior will occur. The molars will, will have a buccal flaring. So that means it is a compensatory mechanism in transverse plane. So this is happening just because in class three cases, many of the class three cases, the, the mandible is in, in front, whereas the maxilla is behind. So means to maintain occlusion, this uh, the anterior part of the maxilla is occluding with the posterior part of the mandible. So that means the, the upper posteriors are having a uh, buccal flaring effect to maintain occlusion. So if we see from the frontal aspect, so this is the inclination you see for the posteriors. You see the hanging of the, of the uh, parental cusp of upper posteriors, especially the molars. So when you see this, so this picture is the Yonsa index so for uh, transverse discrepancy, which is for uh, transverse malocclusions, uh, using the CR as the uh, as the point for uh, uh, molars for evaluating the transverse discrepancy in 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 skeletal malocclusion. In majority of the class three malocclusions, this is one of the important finding. Irrespectively, in fifty more than fifty percent of the cases, you see a transverse problem. So when you have a transverse problem, the many times the upper uh, uh, posterior will be having a buccal flaring and it will be having a, an internal relationship with the posterior. Sometimes if it is more severe or sometimes if it is having a, a compensation on the lower posterior, then the lower posterior will tip lingually. So a lingual rolling or lingual tipping as well as a buccal uh, flaring is a typical feature of uh, posterior, upper posterior in typical class three cases. So if that is there, if it is a skeletal malocclusion. So regarding soft tissue limitations, in many cases, before going for treatment, the soft tissue has to be assessed either using radiographically or 2D or 3D images will give you the clear picture. Especially a CBCT image will, will give you the clear pictures of how much the uh, labial cortex is covered or labial bone is available or palatal bone is, cortical bone is available or how much, especially those patients who are having a pedontal defect, how much the bone is available because especially in lateral movement if you go for a surgical uh, before going for surgical correction if you wanted to move the upper posteriors uh, buccally in those cases where you have a bony digestion initially then you'll have a problem you will land up with loss of more bone in the cortical, cortical region and this will land up with gingival recession as well as other pathological issues Especially this is true in lower anterior region. In those cases, you have a prominent mandible, mandibular prognathism. 
with a retroclin incisor you have a thin labial cortical plate so when you try this when you try to operate this there is again going to be a problem with the lower anterior uh, lower uh, cortical plate labial cortical plate again there is going to be a dehiscence as well as uh, gingival resection will happen so this has to be taken care of and documented some of the soft tissues also has to be uh, has to be uh, evaluated or assessed before going for surgery the tongue position position and posture this is very very important majority of the cases of class 3 the tongue position as well as posture the the posture will be highly anteriorly placed so that has to be addressed and the size of the tongue especially in those cases of class 3 the tongue size will be higher many of the cases you have a macroglossia you can see rachosis uh, uh, cephalometric evaluation to the tongue analysis so in that way you can assess the tongue position as well as tongue size to evaluate whether it is having any influence if it is not correcting ultimately the treatment will have a failure you will correct the malocclusion the profile you are it corrected but ultimately just because of the abdominal function of the tongue from inside as well as other other tissues from inside abdominal tissue function will again produce a relapse tendency tmj again another thing tmj if patient is having a tmj problem that has to be documented well any sort of temporomandibular dysfunction has to be documented it has to be it has to be addressed before because generally there is a feeling that if patient initially having a temporary uh, uh, temporomandibular disorder will ultimately when the when the uh, this is the this skeletal malocclusion will corrected this will get corrected but recent evidence says this is not true there is no association between the malocclusion and the temporomandibular disorder the this temporomandibular disorder is doing occurring because of lot of other issues vertical skeletal malocclusions so these are the typical feature of vertical uh, malocclusions you see there is a increase interlabial gap a narrow um, nasal base cheek bones are flat there is a, a long face this is a typical intraoral feature extraoral feature and on profile view also you can see a, a mandibular plane which is steep majority of the cases will be having a convex profile as well as the chin will be placed back a retro position chin as well as a, a chin uh, throat length will be reduced between surgical and non surgical case this is there is evidence coming now which says that in maxillary for correcting anterior open bite as well as long face with non surgical correction using implants intrusion of maxillary posterior is a, is a good option but this will this will get reasonably good reasonably good results by intrusion of posterior using mini implants or mini mini plates but the thing is there is always a possibility that the once you are not stabilizing the mandibular arch there is this is going to relapse so that means for mandibular uh, uh, arch has to be left stabilized with a full arch uh, ar full arch from continuous arch from 7 to 7 uh, to 7 and that has to be stabilized otherwise the amount of intrusion which you are getting on the upper posterior will have will be com will be com camouflage or compromised by the extrusion of the lower uh, posterior tooth so that means you need to have a rotation or anti clockwise rotation of the mandible to have a correction so regarding the limits of surgical and non surgical correction this is the study one of the study which says that only less than 0.5 less than 5 mm open bite can be corrected using temporary anchor devices so if your open bite is more than skeletal open bite or whatever it is if it is more than 5 mm this has to be addressed by surgically vertical maxillary excess again features there is an increase interlabial gap if the interlabial gap is more than 3 mm excess upper lip visibility will be more than 4 mm again the visibility will be 4 mm or less, less, less than 4 mm it is it cannot be considered as a vertical maxillary excess that means gummy smile increase lower on third the lower on third will be increased compared to upper as well as middle on third in decreased profile angle that means the the angle uh, between the 
glabella subnasal and progonion according to arnett it will be less than 165 degrees decrease throat angle throat, throat length and deep mandibular sulcus so these are the typical features of vertical maxillary excess so once you diagnose this case you can very well see the anterior as well as posterior are in two different planes as well as patient is having a uh, vertical maxillary excess you have to consider a default one superior impaction as well as a anterior maxillary osteotomy to impact the anterior maxilla this is a differential impact okay you can have reasonably good result so this is a modality of treatment you impact the maxilla autorotate the mandible and lower border genioplasty so for long case long phase surgical cases for class 2 cases this is the modality of the general principle is like for long long phase surgical cases you have to go for maxillary impaction or segmental maxillary impaction so this is the this is one of the way to correct the uh, vertical face height so invariably for all class 2 cases if the face is long this procedure has to be done for decreasing the face height because that is the objective mandible auto rotation as well as settling bso settling bso means nothing but you have a, a cut on the maxilla like a bso cut and you allow the mandibular anterior region or to rotate in a counter clockwise manner or anti clockwise manner because this is one of the modality of correcting a class 2 so that is why it is called settling bso obviously lower border osteotomy of the mandible now regarding class 3 cases again see this case patient is having a prognathic mandible class 3 profile and long face see the intraoral features if you can see there is an open cut typically you see in class 3 cases long face cases posterior there is an extrusion anterior again these two are in different planes whereas the mandibular plane is flat it is straight so there is an open bite as well as tongue which can be seen outside so if you go for continuous arch leveling as well as continuous arch leveling and alignment this is what is going to happen you have successfully correct correct the leveling as well as alignment and reasonably good occlusion you will get but see the extra oral results so intraorally she is fine but extraorally her face is not appear to be nice because the vertical pattern is still there because lower border has not attempted osteotomy has not attempted as well as there was an issue see in this case what should have been done is you have to go for superior impaction of the posterior maxilla a differential impaction would have been nice a differential impaction would, would give you a, a, a leveling of the upper uh, occlusal plane as well as maybe it will it will correct the mandibular plane as well as the open bit will also get corrected and you can go for a bso impact so why in class 3 cases in high angle class 3 cases differential impaction especially the posterior maxilla is impacting just because the aesthetics can be improved so anterior uh, lip tooth relationship can be maintained in such a way so this is the way so that means in long phase surgical cases class 3 surgical cases this is a modality differential impaction of posterior maxilla this is to improve the aesthetics or anterior uh, incisor lip relationship can be improved bso setback and lower border osteotomy of the mandible to reduce the face it especially the chin uh, uh, chin uh, incisor lower incisor relation vertical relation short face surgical cases mandibular advancement or segmental maxillary osteotomy or augmentation genioplasty so these are the surgical procedures which are recommended for class 3 cases problem is with mandibular deficiency then mandibular advancement and if it is a maxillary excess segmental maxillary osteotomy and anterior maxillary osteotomy and in mandible you can do a augmentation genioplasty also see this case she is having a short face but the thing is she is having a maxillary excess she has gone for a segmental osteotomy amo upper as well as lower has been aligned and leveled separately and this is the result 
little bit of augmentation genealogy would have been nice in this case. Another case, again, a short case, class two, typical class two case with mandibular deficiency. So majority of the cases, this is a typical feature. Majority of the cases with mandibular deficiency with normal maxilla, you see the, the tongue will be, the, the nose will be projected out. So deep intraorally, you have a deep curvo speed. In such cases, our objective should be to maintain the curvo speed as such before surgery, then you advance the mandible, then you level the uh, curvo speed later. That means extrusion of posteriors later. So this is the way. Again, class three cases. You can have short paced class three cases. Reasonably good correction you can get, it is not a big deal. Airway consideration, this is very, very important. So majority the cases, if, if the, uh, if you are not planning properly the airway or you are not concentrating the airway, this will land up with sleep apnea, especially in classic cases, if you if you set back the mandible too much, you can have a problem with the airway. So this is surgeons uh, use this technique, malampati score, to see the, the airway. This is what they look into, whether this is class one, class two, class three, or class four, depends on the amount of visibility of uvula as well as soft palate. So in, in two dimensional images, that means using a cephalogram, you can use a, analysis to see the pharyngeal airway, upper airway as well as lower airway range can be, can be very well seen using camera analysis. And using a CBCT image, again, you can see the volumetric analysis of the airway. In class three case, this is a problem. You, you see this case, there is a, there is a huge mandible, there is a mid face retrusion. Over that is around 13.5 millimeters, minus 12 A and B, maxillary deficiency, mandibular excess, as well as vertical growth pattern. So in such cases, you have to consider this airway. Whether you go for a you go for a single jaw surgery or two jaw surgery, and which is beneficial, and and which is good for health, his airway. So these are some of the uh, some of the methods to predict airway before treatment. So this is using an equation, which is proposed by Chen et al. So according to them, if you use this equation before surgery, it's a complicated equation. I don't think it is, it is user-friendly, but some way you will have an idea to see the amount of airway, which is patent before surgery. So he only telling that large mandibular setbacks will produce uh, it is predisposing factors are large mandibular setback, obesity, short neck, large tongue. So these are some of the predisposing. If a patient is having all these features, then you have to be very, very careful in setting back the mandible. Such cases, you have to be very, very careful in going for two-jaw surgery. So these are some of the recent evidences which telling about the effect on airway and two-jaw as well as single-jaw surgeries. Bimaxillary surgery promotes less uh, increase, less decrease on the upper airway than mandibular setback alone. So all these studies says that two jaw surgery will 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 have less effect on the total pharyngeal space. So all these studies are telling this. Stability factors. Again, before considering treatment plan, this has to be considered. So stability-wise, maxillary, so any procedure on maxilla is more stable than mandible just because there are a lot of muscular attachments with mandibular, mandible. Single jaw versus two jaw, again, it is more stable with two jaw surgery. Single, single jaw surgeries, especially mandibular surgeries will not be stable enough. Superior position of maxilla is stable than down fracture. Mandibular setback is more stable, stable than advancement. So treatment outcome, again, as I told you, objective outcome measures as well as subjective out outcome measures. Subjective outcome measures, nowadays it is 
coming in 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 two uh, directions number one is based on the patient's own own subjective uh, evaluation or subjective assessment and the population or the crowd so as far as the clinical clinician is concerned so they do the treatment outcome um, based on on the on the amount of skeletal uh, corrections achieved or dental corrections achieved or profile correction achieved or functional corrections achieved whatever it is as far as the patient is concerned there are patient centered outcomes so then general public perception it is there there are tools available now which is called crowd sourcing tools so this is the 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 public's opinion about the corrections which it or public's perception about the correction which is which got on the patient so expected treatment outcome so this is one of the established uh, outcome which is now popular uh, uh, in orthodontics all health related quality of life along with that there are other tools which are which are especially available uh, which is uh, for orthodontic surgery it is oqlq that is orthodontic quality of life questionnaire this is another tool which is especially applicable for uh, orthodontic cases as well as expected facial appearance score so this can be assessed by a was score as well as enthusiasm towards treatment this can also be assessed using the was score that means enthusiasm um, towards treatment means before treatment how much the patient is enthusiastic about her treatment or how the treatment outcome will come after that so this study says that if patient is having a higher oral health related quality of life then the expected outcome will be good higher oral health quality of life questionnaire especially in two domains the social uh, social impairment domain as well as well as functional impairment domain so this is good higher facial appearance score if the patient is having a higher appearance score then the expected outcome will be higher and greater enthusiasm towards surgical treatments that means patient if initially they are having a higher enthusiasm about the treatment then the treatment outcome or expected outcome will also be good so to conclude ideal aesthetics good function and occlusion are the goals of surgical orthodontic treatment a close collaboration with all surgeon in every stage is critical this is very very important so not that initially when you start your treatment maybe after some time once you finish your orthodontic treatment pre surgical orthodontic treatment you discuss with surgeon that is not correct in almost all stages you discuss with the surgeon and have decisions advances in technology especially in materials fixation methods have proposed optimum treatment outcome thank you all for your patience here thank you sir for a wonderful and excellent take on the diagnostic and treatment uh, objectives for orthognathic surgery patients now uh, there are some uh, one or two questions dr vinay ayoni has asked how much auto rotation is expected in millimeter during conventional lifod one impaction as shown in one of the cases 6 mm maxillary impaction was planned and 4 mm mandibular advancement was also planned his question is how much auto rotation is expected in millimeters during conventional lifod one impaction generally study says that it is in the ratio of 1 is to 1 this is occurring only if you have a posterior impaction anterior impaction amo if you go for vertical impaction you will not get only if you have a posterior impaction if you have a 1 mm impaction generally you have 1 mm impaction that is what the study says it is in the 1 is to 1 ratio that means if you have go for 4, 4 mm superior impaction you have you can get 4 mm uh, chin prominence it is not necessary in all cases but generally this is the term okay sir there is also a question from uh, dr tojan chako uh, he is asking uh, sir's opinion about surgery first our uh, philosophy from an orthodontist point of view perspective surgery first is a very good very good option but just because of time constraints i have not gone through that uh, in this session this is not in all cases you can not all surgical cases are not indicated for uh, uh, surgery first approach only in specific cases where you have uh, minimum 
compensations, minimum transverse problems, minimum arsenic two side discrepancy, or borderline cases. With all these features, we can very well go ahead with uh, surgery first approach. But but generally, not in very severe cases, it is not having uh, too much of compensation, dental compensation, too much of crowding, too much of uh, axial inclination problems. You cannot go ahead with uh, surgery first approach. It is a very good option. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again for a wonderful lecture. Now, uh, me, we move on to the next uh, event of the day, that is uh, the book launch, the handbook of preclinical orthodontics. A little bit about the authors. This handbook was written by Dr. Mohammed Shibin and Dr. Baby Jisha. Dr. Mohammed Shibin completed his BDS from Pariyaram Dental College in the year 2011 and completed MDS in orthodontics from Mar Basilius Dental College in 2014. He has backed an IDEA award in 2010 uh, for scoring the maximum marks in the BDS course among all universities in Kerala. And uh, currently he is working as assistant professor in the Department of Orthodontics, Government Dental College, Kodikod. And the second author is Dr. Baby Jisha, she completed her BDS from JSS Dental College, Mysore in 2010. And she completed her MDS in 2015 from Manipal College of Dental Sciences, Mangalore. Currently, she is also the assistant professor in the Department of Orthodontics, Government Dental College, Kori Code. And this book is edited by none other than Dr. Shobha Sundareshan, the professor and HOD of Government Dental College, Kori Code. Now I request Dr. Shobha Sundareshan, Professor and HOD, to speak a few words regarding the relevance of this handbook of preclinical orthodontics and the context in which they have, which prompted them to come out with this book. The virtual stage is yours, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so good morning and uh, wishing everybody a happy Independence Day. First of all, I would like to thank the Kerala Orthodontic Study Group and the Indian Orthodontic Society for having given us such a wonderful uh, platform. And I thank the Honorable President of the Indian Orthodontic Society for having very graciously consented to release this book. In fact, he was so enthusiastic uh, uh, and encouraging when I spoke to him about this and he's been giving us all the proper directions. Thank you so much for having consented. And I also thank the dynamic uh, secretary of the Indian Orthodontic Society, Dr. Sridevi Patmanabhan, a real phenomenal, but very down to earth person. She's uh, the pride of all the women orthodontists, I must say. Thank you so much. Your presence and blessings here, you know, is, uh, is really of great importance. And uh, it, it's, it means a lot to the entire fraternity here. Thank you so much. And as for the book, well, you know, what actually inspired us to go ahead with this is that we found that there are numerous uh, books on clinical orthodontics, you know, uh, dealing it, uh, with uh, in the needs of the, uh, caters to the needs of the uh, undergraduate uh, students, BDS and also the postgraduate students, as well as there are enough and more books on the different uh, specialities, branches of orthodontics, like temporary anchorage devices, aligners, biomechanics, and so on and so forth. But we found that there aren't uh, many books on, you know, basic orthodontics dealing with the removable appliances, you know, for the, uh, the novice dental student on the threshold of the subject of orthodontics, there wasn't much, especially when you start teaching, you know, in the second, third and fourth year. And um, all information had to be gained from various sources. So that's what, you know, then we thought, why not we compile all this? And uh, coming to that, that's when I uh, picked upon this idea, actually, because this was a, a great lacuna, you know, was, and uh, the authors, you know, they are both assistant professors in my department, uh, Dr. Muhammad Shibin and Dr. Baby Disha. Speaking of them, I must say that uh, 
they are full of energy and enthusiasm and you know willing to uh, they go the whole way they uh, the way they have worked you know for this book they're full of ideas especially dr mohammed so i call him the idea boy he's always thinking out of the box i'm sure the future of our department future of uh, a speciality is great if we have youngsters like this coming up you know they are the ones it's their hard work that has culminated in this book i just did the editing and i was it was really wonderful you know working with young blood i would like to uh, you know the others are here with me and uh, I, i would like they would like to you can meet them this is uh, dr baby jisha and dr mohammed shibin happy independence day to all the respected members of our kerala autonomic study group we are extremely thankful for the organizing committee of kerala autonomic study group and ios especially our honorable chief guest and president of ios shilju sir and also our honorable secretary sri devamaya for providing this wonderful platform for and will of our book title handbook of pre clinical autonomics and regarding the legend behind this birth of this book while i was involved in the pre clinical training of undergraduate students i noticed that most of the relevant topics of pre clinical autonomics like autonomic materials and their properties study model preparations wire bending techniques and all the things was captured in different textbooks so i thought why don't we can compile all these things into a single book with in a better form and including more colored pictures and that too in a constraints format so that, so that it will be useful for our undergraduate students as well as for the teachers so with this mind when i discussed this matter with my head shobha ma'am and also my co-author jisha they were so interested and the minute the ma'am told go ahead we will have a full support and ma'am also accepted our request to edit what else we need then we go within the hard work of our entire team work this book was able to complete uh, good morning all i would like to say a few words about this book uh, the unique feature of this book is that it is in a question and answer format this will help to ignite the inquisitive mind of the students uh, also uh, we have added more than 700 questions and answers covering different basic topics uh, it is said that a pictures worth a thousand words so we have added more than 400 colored photographs uh, of demonstrating the wire bending different steps of the wire bending exercises uh, we sincerely hope that this book will be helpful to the students the teachers of the autonomic community uh, the clinicians as well as the dental technicians uh, thank you thank you so much so what do i need with such wonderful people in my department they are raring to go and they are going on with various all kinds of researches also it's wonderful thank you so much for this platform thank you ma'am now i ask uh, our ios president dr silju mathew sir to release the uh, book a uh, very good morning to one and all madam secretary the uh, dynamic conveners of kosg dr deepu leander dr prashant pratap dr ashim ali uh, and all uh, the distinguished members present here today uh, especially dr shobha madam dr sujit sir and i see a lot of seniors uh, it's really nice to uh, be part of the first kosg webinar and uh, today i've been given the honor of releasing a wonderful book when madam first uh, mentioned about releasing the book i think i was more excited than madam because i felt uh, it is uh, a need of the hour a wonderful book especially for the undergraduate students and it was so nice of her to personally courier it to me so that i could uh, physically release the book in this august uh, gathering so here it is uh, the book which has been wrapped beautifully in a wonderful ribbon and uh, i think presented in such a uh, elegant way uh, it's my proud privilege and honor to release uh, this handbook of orthodontics which has been authored by two very young and dynamic upcoming uh, future of ios dr mohammed shabin and dr uh, baby jisha edited by uh, our own dr shobha madam and uh, this book is a very 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 compact 
And it's as it mentions, it is a handbook. It's a ready handbook for students, especially the undergraduate students. And now that most of the universities have uh, started uh, uh, examination at second year preclinical, I think this is going to fill the void because uh, you have so many uh, classic books uh, uh, describing the whole gamut of orthodontics, but hardly any book on Indian context to talk about the preclinical aspects, the metallurgy and the wire bending exercises that uh, go with the preclinical exercises. So this book, uh, as the narrative says, uh, it's a, the aim of this book is to familiarize the budding dental students, dental technicians, and discerning clinicians from the various mechanical possibilities in their day-to-day -day practical work. The book covers in detail the materials used in orthodontics, the theory, the construction of components of removal orthodontic appliance, and the fabrication, all in a question and answer format. The pattern of the book also allows students to prepare for their second BDS preclinical viva voce examination and face the examination with confidence. So with this few words, I officially release this book and I wish the authors all the very best. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Devi, ma'am, a few words from you too. First of all, very happy to be part of this uh, KOSD program. Uh, this virtual platform allows us to travel very quickly and you know, be in different places. And uh, uh, first of all, good morning to all of you, President IOS, and to all the very dynamic conveners. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. And very, very hearty congratulations to you, Shobha. I think a uh, teacher feels most fulfilled when you, know, you see your students doing so well. And uh, this, it's a tribute to you. And hearty congratulations to Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Baby. And uh, I'm sure this book will be of great use to uh, you know, all our members and our students particularly. Once again, a happy Independence Day and a great uh, day and wishes to all the members of KOSD. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank you so much. Now we move on to the most exciting part of our today's webinar. We have two brilliant, enthusiastic orthodontists among us who have been regularly posting fantastic cases in our study group. So we, they have consented to share their wisdom and knowledge with us, uh, Dr. Mugundan Vijayan and Dr. Ija Zanwar. And I asked Dr. Prashant Prada to give a brief intro about them and start with the proceedings. Yeah, first of all, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Shobha ma'am, for your wonderful presence and uh, good luck, uh, Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Baby Disha for the new textbook. Let me introduce the two speakers very quickly. First is my dear friend, uh, Dr. Mukundan Vijayan. And if I read about his awards and accomplishments, it might look like uh, I'm just going through a billboard of the ro different royal colleges uh, around Europe. At present, Dr. Mugudan Vijayan, he is the Associate Professor, Department of Orthodontics, Government General College, Alapura, and he holds uh, 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 MDS as the MORTH RCS from uh, Edinburgh, uh, England, Glasgow, and uh, FFD or RCS from Ireland. Uh, he finished his uh, uh, graduation from uh, GDC Trivandrum with the uh, first rank in, uh, he, he also holds the first rank in various degree examination in the year 2001. He holds the first rank in all Kerala postgraduate entrance examination 2003, second rank in all India postgraduate entrance examination 2004, first rank in Kerala PSC examination for the post of assistant professor in orthodontics in September 2006. Come to your next speaker, that is Dr. Ijaz Anwar, an upcoming uh, 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 tycoon of orthodontics who just plays around with uh, different bone screws with unbelievable results. He finished graduation from Enapoya in the year uh, 2009 and uh, his post graduation from Poor Institute of Dental Sciences in the year 2015. He holds uh, a more RCPS from Glasgow as well as uh, MFBS RCS uh, from London. He is a consultant orthodontist across the state. First, I invite uh, Dr. Mugandan to showcase uh, his cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. 
can you hear me? Am I audible? Okay, I think I'm sorry. Yes, you're audible. You're audible, Dr. Mukun. Okay, thank you. But greetings, my dear ones, and uh, happy Independence Day to you all. Uh, respected Honorary President IOS, uh, dear Silju sir, Honorary Secretary, very dear Sridevi Madam, conveners of KOSG, Dr. Dipoli Ander, Dr. Prashant, Dr. Hashimali, uh, dignitaries and panelists. First of all, uh, let me thank IOS and the KOSD for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity of a presentation on this platform. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, a word of appreciation uh, to uh, dear Srijit sir for this wonderful presentation, giving a detailed insight into diagnosis and treatment planning of uh, surgical cases. And then congratulations to Dr. Jisha, Dr. Shipin, and uh, dear Shoba Madam for compiling, uh, publishing, and uh, you know, um, this much awaited book on curriculum in orthodontics. This was a long time coming, and thank you so much for this. So I would be uh, following in on three such footsteps. I would be presenting two case reports. Two orthodontic, orthodontic surgery cases. One is a conventional surgery case, and the other one is pre orthodontic surgery, that is, surgery post orthodontics. Going into the first case, this is an 18 year old female. The patient complains of forwardly placed lower jaw. The parents are very, very concerned that. Uh, you know, she doesn't talk much. She is very withdrawn. And, uh, you know, she's very reluctant to face the outside world. And, uh, you know, they are, uh, literally they are afraid that, you know, when their children, they don't talk back and they are very, very withdrawn and uh, devoid of confidence, the parents are very, very concerned. Just giving you a few seconds to have a look at the extra oral photographs. You can see that evidently it's a very severe class three case. She has a very labored smile. On the frontal view, this is a very long and narrow face. The lower third of the face is 70 millimeter, the middle third is 65 millimeter. That is marked asymmetry. You can see that the mandible is shifted to the right. There is asymmetry in the zygoma, which is uh, more discernible in another photograph, which I will come to later. So this is basically a long and narrow face. There is decreased visibility of the incisors as well. There is some scleral show. There is flattening of the malar eminences, which is again asymmetric. The nose is symmetrical with no deviation. So the dorsum of the nose and the tip can be used for assessing the facial symmetry. The alar base is little narrow. Lips are incompetent. The upper lip length is normal. Normal upper lip length is around 18 to 22 millimeter. This is 20 millimeter. So this is normal. There is no incisor show at rest. And during smile, only five millimeters of upper incisor is visible, which is only about half of the length of the upper incisor. There is an upper midline shift to the left. There is a lower midline shift again to the left, but you can see that the chin is deviated to the right. There is a midline shift to the left, but there is a 
mandibular symmetry to the right. On the profile view, it's a concave profile. The nasolabial angle is acute. Nasolabial angle is, uh, you know, nasolabial angle is acute in maxillary incisor proclination, maxillary prognathism, and even maxillary retrognathism. In maxillary retrognathism, nasolabial angle is acute because there is no support for the upper incise or for the upper lip. The upper incisors are far back to support. So the upper part of the lip just sags back and the nasolabial angle becomes acute. The lips are thin because again, there is lack of adequate support for the upper lip. The upper lip is thin mainly. The mandolabial sulcus is average. The nose is flat. The FMA is high. There is a mentalis strain present because of the stretching of the uh, mentalis muscle and mouth opening is adequate. These are the intraoral photographs. There is minimal overbite, one millimeter. The overjet is reverse overjet of eight millimeter. Upper and lower arches are of normal width, no U shape. Molar relation is class three. And there are no abnormalities detected in the soft tissues. There is only mild crowding in the upper and lower arches. Now this crowding in the lower arch this crowding even though it is only very mild crowding when you align the lower incisors the lower incisor is going to lean against the mesial edge of the canine. So even with minimal alignment, the decompensation of the lower incisor would be very significant. You can see that despite the presence of very minimal crowding, once you align this, the lower incisors are going to lean on the mesial edge of the canines and they are going to tip forward. So that is the answer for how to decompensate in the lower arch. Then the canines, you have to see the canine relation. This is very, very severe class day. This is as severe as you can get. See this one and this one here. This is one canine here and another canine here. So this is supposed to be here. This is the normal relationship. So this is more than one premolar width, probably around two, 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 two width. This is the pre-treatment cephalogram. The upper incisors are proclined, lower is slightly retroclined. Retinal arch percent. as you are going through a detailed diagnosis class, this is pretty straightforward. This is skeletal class three deformity with uh, maxillary deficiency, mandibular prognathism. There is procline upper incisors and retrocline lower incisors. So the pre-surgical orthodontics, this is where we come in. It in involves non-extraction alignment of the lower arch, decompensation of upper incisors with extraction of first premolars, then coordination of the arch width. But this is very important, coordination of the arch width. Uh, every now and again, you have to take models during pre-surgical orthodontics and hand articulate them. Look for the coordination of transverse dimensions. You know, sometimes you go through very laborious pre-surgical orthodontics and you know, spend one year just decompensating incisors. And finally, if you, when you think that you are ready for the surgery and you take the models, you find that there is no transverse coordination. So this should go simultaneously so that you don't lose the time. The pre-surgical orthodontics here took 
uh, one year and six months, which was pretty long. Sometimes in very severe class three, it is very difficult to decompensate the upper incisors because sometimes the upper canines, when you retract, they hit against sometimes the lower premolars or the bolas. The occlusion is all derailed and there is stiff resistance from the from the normal occlusion. Usually the upper canines, when you retract normally, you know, it slides around the outside of the lower arch. But here it was not the case and it was very, very difficult to decompensate it. And this is one of the, the, the problems of conventional orthodontics. Sometimes decompensations take a very long time. And then sometimes, uh, you know, the patient is in for a shock. The, the appearance just worsens. So this is how she was after the decompensation. She has lost a lot of weight also. This is the extent of skeletal discrepancy. You can see the hollowing of the malar region, how deficient the maxilla is. You know, even from the profile view, you can see the increased pleural visibility. You can see the protrusion of the lower lip. Now, by this time, the patient was really, really withdrawn. surgical intraoral photographs. We began with a reverse overjet of eight millimeters and we ended up with a reverse overjet of 13 millimeters. This overjet is evident in the next photograph. So when you have a reverse opposite of 13 millimeters, the magnitude of correction would be at least 15 millimeters because you have to have two millimeters of normal opposite. So reverse opposite of 30 millimeters plus two millimeter for normal opposite. That is the minimum magnitude of correction. I always advise giving at least three millimeters of overcorrection, which in this case, the surgeon was uh, very, very confident that the occlusion would hold if you put that in normal occlusion and that no overcorrection would be required. So the magnitude of surgical correction plan was, I said 15 before it was 16. surgical radiographs. There is a there is a asymmetry in the malar region. The condor here and the condor here are little different. It is fuller here and flatter here. because the maxilla as a whole is shifted to this side. You can see the midline, the, low, the upper midline is shifted to this side. Even the lower midline is shifted to this side. But paradoxically, the mandible is shifted to this side. So this calls for a centering genoplasty. Actually, genoplasty, advancement genoplasty is a standard surgical procedure along with mandibular setback. Because when you set back the mandible over a long distance, the the chin throat length, it decreases, which is unaesthetic. So to maintain the chin throat distance, the surgeon usually, they do an advancement genoplasty. They 
you know, put the cut at an angle and slide the chin forwards so that the chin throat length is increased as well as there is a slight accentuation of the chin contour. So while doing that, there is a centering genioplasty that is also recommended. Both can be done simultaneously. And there was no maxillary can. So doing a maxillary surgery, there was no need for any vertical and asymmetrical vertical corrections. These are the Cox values. The values on the red, they are abnormal. This is basically uh, depicting the maxillary hyperplasia, mandibular excess, then maxillary incisor proclination, mandibular incisor. They are up right now. So these are 3D images. These 3D images, they help the surgeon for virtual surgical planning. You know, they can move the segments. They can place cuts wherever they want and they can move the segments and they can put the segments in place and beforehand they can calculate the differential movements on either side. So the treatment plan here was high level lay foot one osteotomy with an advancement of eight millimeters. Then a mandibular setback with BSSO of eight millimeter, genoplasty for advancement and centering. This is a 3D mock surgery. You can see the high leaf foot one, the zygomatic process of maxilla. Usually they place the, for leaf foot one, they place the cut below the nasal floor, no, below, the, below the orbit, and they don't extend it into the zygomatic arches. You can see that the zygomatic process has come forward. This aids in bringing the Malar abundances forward. So this is uh, very, this model surgery is very similar to you know hand articulating the model, but the difference is that you have the condyles which are in place. So it is possible to you know reposition the surgical segments and check how much correction is required on either side. So you can see here that you can see here that the occlusion is well coordinated on both arches. You have to look at the premolar and the canine conclusions. So then surgical splints were fabricated after Facebook transfer and mounting on a semi-adjustable articulator. The first picture is where we have placed the provisions for eight millimeter advancement. The second one, bottom left, is the intermediate splint with backstreet advancement. The one on the right is the mandibular setback, again, eight millimeters. I would have preferred at least three more millimeters of mandibular setback. This is the high leaf foot one. This is the difference. This process during high leaf foot one, this zygomatic process it comes anteriorly and it gives a fullness to the chin, fullness to the 
cheeks. Usually leaf out one cuts are placed here. Surgery was uh, done by Dr. Thomas Bosch from Amanda Institute of Medical Science. This is immediate posture. You can see the widening of LR bases, which usually happens with axillary surgery. You can see that the chin has been centered. You know, it is difficult to discern the centering of the chin because of the you know, edema associated with the nose. You can see the, the fullness of the cheeks. These were taken immediately, probably a couple of days later. Some brackets are gone. This happens when they place the splints. The photographs of are not good quality, taken on a mobile phone, sent to me. This is one month post op. The edema has subsided sufficiently, but still there is some edema. I still say that this is the best appearance that she has had because she is of a very you know, frail type of body. And uh, she all, she's always thin, there is no fat on the face. Whenever there is, you know, whenever her cheeks are full, it, it looks really beautiful. So this is four months post-op. As I mentioned earlier, there is a chance for lapse. I always advise the surgeon to place at least three millimeters of overcorrection during the surgical procedure. And I, as far as possible, I make the splints such a way. But as I mentioned earlier, the surgeon was very confident and uh, uh, we put it in full of good occlusion, but despite the confidence, you can see that it has relapsed. It is not very difficult to correct this because you can very well give plaster elastics and uh, bring it into occlusion. But uh, as you know, plaster elastics at this stage is actually a, a, a method of compensation rather than skeletal correction. So you might be able to achieve the occlusion into perfect class one, but there would be some relapse of the surgical segment. So what you ultimately need is an occlusion on the left with the maxilla and the mandible in the desired positions. But what you get on the right is the, the surgical segments have relapsed a bit and hence the occlusion has relapsed. What as an orthodontist you can do is you can correct the occlusion, but you can't do anything about the surgical segments. I won't say that this is too bad, but again, something for you to, this is, uh, you know, uh, to take note and you know, carry forward into the next case. This is post-treatment. You can see the happiness. This is on the day of debone, so that uh, uh, you never mind that little bit of gumminess. It is on the day of debone. This is inflamed gingiva. Within a couple of days, this is going to go. Now she has colored her hair herself. So look at the confidence now. This is the post-treatment occlusion. It has come down and settled into a very nice class one canine relation, very nice over jet, good centered upper and lower central incisors. Very good posterior intercuspation. 
but this is how all surgical cases should be finished in my opinion because you have this opportunity of creating the occlusion beforehand and uh, you know checking it and rechecking it and putting it into uh, you know hand articulated models and checking and rechecking again this is how you should be able to finish it post surgical radiographs Max ray advancement, mandibular setback, and arterioplasty. From this, from a very severe class three, she developed some uh, enamel demineralization during the course of treatment and uh, we had to do some composite fillings on the upper canines, lower premolars. So this is what I work for, you know, the happiness and, you know, creating a very happy and confident individual. I later came to know that she's a very, very talented artist and Later, she was, you know, kind enough to share some of her drawings, you know, pencil, color pencil drawings, which uh, she had kept, you know, away from the world. And I thought that it was a very, very big loss to the world that we could not see it earlier. This is her drawing on color pencil. This is very good. The I was blown away by this one. To think that she kept this away from the world. You know, right now she is very confident. Uh, she has Instagram pages on this. And I just wish that uh, you know, she goes out and conquers the world. Good luck and Godspeed. This is the second case. Eighteen-year-old female. This complaints of forwardly placed lower jaw. Pre-treatment photographs. So this is the skeletal class three. Intraorally, you can see a very significant class three molar relation, class three canines. There is mild crowding of the upper arch. There is a moderate crowding of the lower arch. Some incisors are in cross bite. Some are edge to edge. surgical radiographs for your treatment. So quickly into diagnosis. Indexing the models you have to cut out triangular wedges from the base of the models. And then you have to duplicate these models. This duplication is done in an agar conditioning bath, reversible hydrocolloid, which is a duplicating mechanism, duplicating material of choice. So these are the duplicated models. This is not the models of this patient. Just illustrative purpose only. And then, so you, you now have two models, two sets of models. One would be called, called the articulated models, 
the other one would be called the working models so phase bot transfer is done and then one set of models is articulated these are articulated uh, with little bit of separating uh, material vaseline so that it comes out very easily on a tap and once it comes out you have these spikes these are orientation spikes which helps you to replace these models without any changes in any dimension so you can take out one model you can take out an articulated model and you can take you can put in a working model on the left you have the articulated model i have taken out the articulated model and put in a working model again just for illustration how to do it okay now we go into the pre surgical orthodontics on the working models here on the upper arch decompensation was planned by removing the first premolar and band 6 7 and 5 these are the anchorage segments align this segment and decompensate this is the plan with the use of mini screws it is possible to precisely control the anchorage in all three planes of space so i would say that the use of mini screws has revolutionized surgery for orthodontics so as an orthodontist i have planned a high anchorage retraction of the upper anterior region i would be getting around 7 mm of space here i have given leeway for 2 mm of anchorage loss and 5 mm of retraction so you have to measure and record the mesial distal of all the teeth because when you do scheduling setup and you section individual teeth there is loss of tooth material and when you do the wax up there might be loss of arch length you have to remember that this is the movement that you are going to achieve after you start your orthodontic treatment so there, there it has to be very precise so for that with a with a caliper you have to measure and record the mesial distal width of the teeth our initial plan was non extraction alignment of the lower arch and extraction of first premolar in the upper arch and decompensation but later uh, we changed it into extraction in the lower arch also but that i will come to later on the left you can see that mesial to the molars i have measured and recorded the arch width and marked it on a brass wire and after doing the wax setup i have ensured that there is no loss of arch length along the incisal edges and the cusp tips okay so we have done the casting setup on the upper and lower models also there is compensation in the transverse plane both in the upper and the lower arches you can see that these are the upper molars by giving a cut here and without any loss of model material very fine cuts and moving it and slightly giving a leverage like this here it is always touching so that there is a maintenance of the vertical dimension so this is like you know you are twisting the upper molars inwards and this is possible to replicate this movement exactly in the mouth also so this is compensation in the transverse plane
and after the Kessling setup, you take out the articulated models and replace it with the working models on the articulator. Now on the upper arch, you can see that, see this line was the original line. This is two millimeter. There is some forward movement of this segment. I have moved this segment forward by two millimeter. That is angular loss of two millimeters. This segment has moved forward by two millimeters. And the, this whole anterior segment has moved backwards by five millimeters. This by two millimeters. This is for anchorage loss in the upper arch. Okay, you can plan without any anchorage loss in the upper arch also. If you are using mini screws, you can hold the molars in place, both sagittally as well as in vertically or in transverse dimension, you can hold it in place and you can do it without any anchorage loss. So it depends on whatever you want. When you have mini screws, it is possible to control the anchorage, and even if you lose anchorage, it is possible to recover the anchorage. On the lower on the lower cast, you can see that I have cut this segment. This is for transverse decompensation. But you have to see that these lines are coinciding for now, because my initial plan was non-extraction decompensation in the lower arch. This was to go for a single jaw procedure mandibular setback. So this was non-extraction in the lower arch, extraction in the upper arch. So the anchorage value, I mean anchorage segment in the lower arch was not going to come forward. The anchorage segment in the upper arch was going to come forward by two millimeter. The anterior segment after alignment would move back. And this is the extent of skeletal discrepancy that you got after the on the bottom photograph, you can see the extent of skeletal discrepancy. So at this point, you do the mock surgery on the model, on the articulated models, on, on this models. Model surgery is done on the articulated. You take out, this is for mandibular setback. So you remove the lower models, put it in occlusion with some overcorrection, and then again, mount it with plaster of Paris. After you had, after you have done this, you have pulled it back, pulled it back, set it in occlusion in the desired occlusion with some overcorrection. Now what you do is you take this model out, take this model out, put in the original models. So. If you want to have this occlusion, if you were doing orthodontics beforehand, and if you wanted this occlusion right after surgery, this is the position that the surgeon has to achieve. From here, if you remove upper four, align and retract the upper arch, you align the lower arch, you will finally end up with this. And with some relapse, you will end up with very good class one incisor and canine relation. This was the plan. But the problem was, this was, this magnitude was too much. This was too much for a single jaw procedure. So sir was talking about airway consideration. This involved a correction of around 14 to 15 millimeters in the mandible itself which was, uh, surgeon was very, very skeptical about this. So finally we decided to reduce the magnitude and do a decompensation in the lower arch by lower arch extractions. So this was back to the drawing board, not very difficult. Take this out, you plan for some mesial movement of the anchorage segment here, this movement, mesial movement. Place it one millimeter or 1.5, because anchorage is more in the lower arch. If you lose two millimeter in the upper arch, uh, with second molar banding and a very small root surface area of the lower incisors, you don't expect to lose more than one to 1.5 millimeters. So this is one, 
millimeter forward movement of the posterior segment, remove this four and set back the anterior segment. So this was uh, done in a jiffy on the day before the procedure. I don't have uh, the photo of the splint on this. This is on the day of surgery. You can see that the magnitude has decreased slightly, not too much. This was uh, done by Dr. George Vagi, sir, Pushpagiri Dental College. This is two weeks post-surgical with splints in place. So from a class three, she looks more of a class two now. Orthodontic treatment was started one month post-surgical. The upper teeth were bonded. The upper six and sevens were banded. I could not do banding on the lower arch because uh, she could not, you know, uh, bear through the pain of putting a band pusher on the molar because the cut was placed in the lower jaw. Surprisingly, this is one month review. Look at the alignment. This is something called regional acceleratory phenomenon because the entire locality is flooded with inflammatory markers and products and hence the tooth movement, the tooth movement being an inflammatory, inflammation mediated procedure or process, the alignment was very, very fast. This is the retraction phase. So all this alignment, retraction, everything was planned on the articulator. Now it is up to you, the orthodontist, to simulate whatever you have planned into the process. This is post-treatment. This was finished in 11 appointments. From strap up to debone, this was 11 appointments. This took more than one year, but 11 appointments because she missed some appointments due to COVID situation. And this is the final occlusion. Now exactly as planned on the articulator. As I mentioned earlier, as orthodontist, this is what you look for in your surgical cases that you can plan the occlusion beforehand. These intercus patients, these canines fit in. So this is a class three case. This is of uh, moderate to severe class 3 case with significant dental problems. This was to be decompensated with extractions. But still, this was done with a surgery first approach with meticulous planning and good execution of spleen fabrication. This is real hard work, you know, surgery first orthodontics, you know, doing all the duplication, uh, the testing setup, uh, sometimes you know, revisiting your surgical plan, but this is worth it. So from the left, pre-treatment to surgery first and to post-surgical orthodontics. This is how it finished.
very severe class 3 into very good class for dental perspiration of canines, molars, premolars, and nice over budget. So finishing on a happy note, reminiscing the good old times IOS and IOCs have given us and uh, you know how they have indulged us fondly remembering uh, the last IOC at Bhubaneswar and our visit to Konark and Puri, me and uh, all uh, the friends from Calicut, Chova Madam, Vinu Purushottaman sir, Leti sir, Freyari sir, JK, Renjit, Devishankar. So I, I wish we could all have physical conference sooner than later and hope we can meet, catch up, laugh, joke, and have a good time. And of course, share knowledge. Thank you, dear ones, and uh, have a very nice day. Thank you, Dr. Mugundan, for that wonderful presentation. And I hope uh, you have uh, showed us to good variety of cases. And uh, we have a question from Dr. Uh, Revishankar. One second. Yes, uh, his question is, uh, what's your opinion regarding flipping of lower uh, incisor brackets in class 3 due compensation, surgical cases, and also non-surgical end mass distillation using TADS? Flipping of Lower incisor bracket, probably he is uh, referring to the MBT brackets. It's I, I would say it is better not to use MBT brackets for class 3 cases because of the negative torque of the lower incisors. It's better to use road brackets. Of course, when you are using the MBT brackets, you can consider flipping them. But then again, I would prefer to have a conventionally bonded bracket. So rather than using an MBT bracket, you rather use road brackets. And about the end mark distillation of the lower arch. Of course, uh, if the skeletal discrepancy is mild to moderate, you can consider end mass distillation of the lower arch after extracting the thermolas. Uh, the thing to consider is the thickness of the lingual cortical plate of the lower incisor region. Uh, of course, x-rays will help you, but sometimes during treatment, when you feel it with your fingers, you can very well feel that sometimes the incisor roots are dehiscing into the uh, lingual gingiva. So it is your call. You have to decide whether this is you know, this can be accommodated in the envelope of discrepancy of cats, or it is beyond that. I would say that mild to moderate cases, even some mild, uh, some moderate cases, I have had successes with cats, but you have to be careful in what you promise to the patient. Uh, if it is moderate to severe, I would always recommend surgical procedures in the lower arch, in the maxillary arch, of course, you have more leeway. You can, even for severe maxillary excess cases, you TADS uh, give you very good results. But in the lower arch, again, it's, you have to take a wise call. Okay. He has also asked, can you elaborate more on the leaning back of lower incisor to the mesial of canine 
and its significance during decompensation stage see sometimes they, when you have a crowded lower arch what you get is the contact between the lower canine and the lower second the lateral incisors lower canine and the lateral incisors they are good what you get is probably little bit imbrication of the central incisors so for that patient when you do a alignment you don't get much change in the lower incisor inclination you get good alignment but the lower incisors don't lean forwards so for that cases to make the lower incisors more upright you have to look for other means maybe you have to torque the lower incisors sometimes you have to give push coil springs between the canines and the premolars space might open up but then it is a surgical objective that predominates so to decompensate those cases where the lower incisors are retroclined with minimal crowding it takes some effort but when you have minimal crowding with the lower segment the lower anterior segment in such a way that the incisors are more or less well aligned and the the crowding is between the canine and the lateral incisor and the lateral incisor has as a whole is you know slipping behind the contact point of the canine when you pull this this uh, lateral incisor, when you pull this lateral incisor forward into the uh, alignment of the lower arch and this lateral incisor leans on the mesial edge of the the canine which is again tip mesial so that that leaning gives this lower incisors a leverage to flare forwards so that is the difference that lateral incisor coming into normal relationship with the canine it uh, causes a flaring of the lower incisors lower incisors so that decompensation becomes little bit easier that is what i meant thank you dr mohundan now uh, thanks once again now we move on to the next uh, speaker dr eja sanwar uh, i think uh, uh, i invite dr eja sanwar the virtual floor is yours thank you so much dr people thank you thank you so much thank you i yours once again thank you yours hello sir can i can you see my screen yes yes dr ajas you are also audible you can proceed okay thank you so a very, very good afternoon to all of you uh, so i'll be talking on non surgical treatment of vertical maxillary access purely from a clinical perspective that was two amazing presentations from sriji sir and mugundan sir and it's like thinking what to have after two heavy biryani we will have a small lime tea so throughout this seminar i will be walking through some of the doubts i had some of the answers i got and some of the mistakes i made through this process so what is a long face syndrome the long face syndrome will be um, characterized by extreme clockwise rotation of the mandible with a high angle and adenoid facies and vertical maxillary excess so what is the classic approach for treatment of orthodontic surgery as we all know it is leaford bone impaction without without mandibular surgery so care is there an alternative to treat these cases without surgery so what are tads for so usually when we ask this question the first thing that comes to our mind is anchorage when a posterior teeth is missing we will use tads to retract the anterior teeth we will use tads uh to prevent mesialize uh, to prevent the posterior teeth from mesializing so uh, it's mainly for anchorage that is the answer what we, what comes to our mind so why a tats called revolution way because in uh, in the old days we used to deal with the anchorage we used we had the um, palatal bars we had the headgears we had the cortical anchorage but are these tats only for uh, anterior posterior anchorage the answer lies in the vertical and transverse control that can be achieved with tats which could not have been possible earlier so i'll be just uh, mentioning about one basic biomechanics of one of the most simple most common most underutilized and powerful mechanics that can be used with tats so here 
I'll be strictly uh, sticking on uh, to what happens when we uh, use this post system from a clinical scenario. I will not be diving into the biomechanics, but purely what happens in a clinical scenario. For ease of understanding, we will decide, uh, we will divide the uh, unit into anterior unit and a posterior unit, and what happens to these two units. And we will be concentrating on one of two of the most important things that happen clinically when we only use an intrusive force. So when we only use an intrusive force using an anterior tear, of course, the anteriors will intrude and there will be also be a flaring of the anterior tear, that is positive root torque. Because the tooth is connected from seven to seven, it will act as a unit. So there will be a rotation of the occlusal plane, which causes anterior intrusion and posterior extrusion. So what happens when you give only a posterior reactive fo retractive force? When we give a posterior retractive force, of course, there will be retraction of the anterior teeth, plus there will be torque loss with regard to the anterior teeth. And because the segment will act as a unit, there will be anterior extrusion and posterior intrusion. This posterior intrusion is very critical in treatment planning. So what happens when we combine both these forces? When we combine the anterior and the posterior force, the resultant force goes through the center of resistance of maxilla and intrudes the maxillary teeth. So let's go to some of the mistakes I made. And these mistakes happened during the first wave of COVID where we couldn't see the patient for, the, for around six to eight months. After all, the only real mistakes is the one from which we learn nothing. So here is a case of oligodontia in which the incisors were super erupted. And see the smile line, the incisors were severely super erupted. And so what we gave? So we gave an anterior tear and an intrusive force. So what are the two things that will happen as discussed earlier? The upper anteriors will intrude and the upper anteriors will flare. That is, there will be positive root torque. And what happens to the occlusal plane? The occlusal plane will not rotate because it is a segmented mechanics. So what is the effect of posterior retractive force in an open, open by case? only posterior retractive force. So what happens here? So we give a posterior retractive force only. The, post, the anteriors got retracted and there was severe torque loss with regard to the upper and the lower anteriors. See the bunging of the lower uh, incisors and the washer board effect. So the two things that happen, re the retract and dislike the anterior teeth and torque loss in relation to the anterior teeth. And what happens to the occlusal plane? There, there will be anterior extrusion and there will be posterior intrusion. And see the, see the uh, posterior open bite when the molars intruded because the second molars were not uh, included. And what could have been done? We could have added a, an intrusive force in the anterior region to uh, counteract these side effects. So is the force system sufficient to intrude the posterior teeth? So let, let, let's take an example where the wire got fractured 1925 stainless steel wire got fractured mesial to the first molar. See the amount of intrusion we got. See the plane of occlusion with regard to the premolar and the molar. The severe anterior intrusion was achieved. And of course, there will be anterior tooth loss. But I am yet to comprehend how this 1925 wire broke. So in a straight wire mechanics, it is better not to divide into anterior and posterior segment as the entire arch will act as a single unit but be divided into anterior and posterior unit just for ease of understanding. So what happens in the lower arch? The exact same thing that happens in the lower upper arch happens in the lower arch. So can we truly intrude a molar? Yes, the literature says so. The mean intrusive movement of the maxillary molars was achieved from three to four millimeter with a maximum of eight millimeter. That is a huge change. Uh, at least we can achieve between three to four millimeter. And what happens when we intrude the upper molar, the upper and lower molars? There will be auto rotation. So, in a classical surgical approach, the surgeon, we know that when the surgeon impacts the maxilla, the mandible will auto rotate. The same thing happens here. When we intrude the molar, the, there's 100% vertical change of the mendon. That is, eight, 28 open bite cases, 28 of the 28 open bite cases had a work vertical change in position of mentor, 80% of horizontal change of pogonia. The overbite deepened two folds with a 60% in increase in overjet. Actually, the, there's a type error. It is 60% decrease in overjet, but leave it. So the summary says that, suppose we intrude the maxillary molar by three millimeter 
80% of the three millimeter will be forward movement of Pogonia. So let's look at a case number one. So here is a case of vertical maxillary access with the patient rejected orthognathic surgery. So the three things that should never be missed, these are not, not the three things that should be looked for, the three things that should never be missed while treating a case uh, non-surgically are the incisor exposure at rest, total maxillary excess, and the amount of dendroalveolar protrusion. And the three things you should always rule out is the airway obstruction, lip hypermobility, and the tooth width height ratio, that is the altered passive eruption. So what are the sweet spots of treatment in a vertical maxillary excess? These are the incisor exposure at rest and the dental alveolar protrusion. The more the incisor exposure at rest and severe the dental alveolar protrusion, the easier the case becomes. So we should differentiate between anterior excess and a posterior excess. So this case was a total maxillary excess. Uh, uh, this anterior excess can be um, made out from the frontal photo, and the posterior excess can be uh, made out from the three fourth photos. So the OPG shows an RCT inflation of one six and impacted third molars. Uh, the profile shows a convex profile, increased lip strain, clockwise rotation of mandible, classic adenoid species. The cephalometric analysis shows a skeletal class two with long, uh, with increased vertical proportions and long facial height. So what is the treatment plan? The treatment plan includes simultaneous intrusion and retraction with counterclockwise rotation of the mandible. So that's a whole a lot amount of uh, retraction that is the planned. So can we retract respecting the anatomic boundaries? So when we retract, the tooth can hit the label, the lingual cortical plate, and there can be root resorption and non-vitality of the anterior teeth. So let's take into account the funnel analog. And let's take into account, this is the lingual cortical plate. And suppose this is the label cortical plate. And when we do conventional retraction, the teeth will hit the lingual cortical plate and there'll be a root resorption. But as we intrude and retract, the tooth goes into the wider portion of the alveolus and we can retract even more. So we should always respect the anatomic boundaries. So what's the treatment progress? So here, an MBT uh, O2 slot was used with all first premolars extraction. Five tags were used, four in the posteriors and one in the anterior. 1925 stainless steel with anterior positive root torque with heat treatment was given. The posterior tags failed after one year, but it was not replaced. It is preferable all, in this mechanics, it is preferable always to use a gray or clear pouchings because the post deterioration of this pouching is compared less uh, to colored etchings. And a special importance should be given to the anterior intrusive force and it should be very light because the force will be concentrated on the apex of the central incisors and it risks root resorption. And always activate only once in two months. So let's see the progress. So a sufficient amount of intrusion and retraction was achieved and there was good auto rotation of the mandible. So, so after achieving uh, good auto rotation and intrusion and retraction, remaining spa extraction space was closed by reciprocal anchorage, maintaining and controlling the vertical. In these type of cases, we should always look for the incisor exposure at rest in every three months. So that is very critical. And during the reciprocal space closure, the patient got a, a job in a central agency and had to leave. So the space closure was not yet completed. Yet, let's see, let's see the post-treatment results. The total treatment time was 2.5 years. And these are the post-treatment results. An adequate intrusion retraction was achieved as planned. And there was reduction in the facial height, reduction in the convexity, and an auto rotation of the mandible. The patient was ad advised gingivectomy, especially in regard to the upper right side, but it was not performed. So what happened? The superimposition shows as we planned, there was intrusion and retraction and it, there was a good odd rotation of the mandible. And the result shows as we discussed with the uh, odd rotation mandible. So what about the stability? Are these cases stable or will it relapse? So let's see the results 1.5 years post treatment. The results remain stable. The auto rotation was maintained. The smile improved.
So the right side in the post treatment photo, there was uh, a, a little overgrowth and it was uh, the gingectomy was advised. But after 1.5 years, even after gingectomy, it improved a little. And the results were stable. So there is an increase in number of patients rejecting orthopedic surgery, especially with the advent of social media. So why is it so? The patient goes back and search the YouTube jaw surgery, and this is what it appears. And we have seen a lot more patients uh, rejecting orthopedic surgery, which were originally planned for surgery. And this is quite unfortunate. And here is a case of uh, a similar case in which a bio surgery was planned, but this patient rejected surgery in the middle. So can we treat this case non-surgically? Can we attempt treating this case non-surgically? Let's see the three points never to be missed. The incisor exposure trust, the total maxillary excess, and dental alveolar protrusion. The increased incisor exposure trust, good case. Total maxillary excess, good case. Increased dental alveolar protection, very good. So the OPG shows a mutilated dentition with multiple missing teeth. The cephalometric analysis shows the classic features of a vertical max lexus, a, class, a skeletal class two with clockwise rotation of mandible, increased facial height, hip strain. So the treatment plan is simultaneous intrusion and retraction with counterclockwise rotation of the mandible. So is there any difference between the biomechanics of the first case and the second case? Yes. The answer lies in the position of the upper incisors. The upper incisors were normally positioned, whereas in the first case, it was proclined. So the biomechanics was MBT or 2 slot. Three tads were placed in the upper, two in the posterior and one in the anterior. No tads were placed in the lower arch. And instead, we used bi turbo in sevens. A 1925 wire with anterior root lock with heat treatment was given. And long power arms with or crimble hooks were used to maintain the incisor position and to control the torque during simultaneous intrusion and retraction. I see the first case where there was a proclined upper incisor. We invite, in, we, we used an inverted hook. When we use this inverted hook, there will be increased posterior intrusive force and there will be increased anterior um, uh, talk loss. So we should always, in this first case, we should always look for the anterior loss of anterior, to, uh, anterior talk loss and change uh, from an inverted position to a normal position as the incisors upright. In the second case, we used in this case, we used an, a long power arm. And Andy, the subapical extra radicular tags were used, and an uh, O2, um, O12 ligature tie was used. You can use the, the, the long Kobayashi hooks. So there was a developing posterior crossbite, and the arch wire was expanded as, as necessary. And when you see the classic literature, John Lynn's book, they use diamond system and the diamond system will be having an expanded arch form. So they will not have be, they, they will not come through this um, uh, complication. So we should always check for the arch coordination and expand the arch form as required. And if the tad is pale, placed superior to that attached gingiva, that is in the mold tissue, use ligature wire tie or a noni hook as introduced by Fairbanker. What are the post-treatment results? The post-treatment results shows not a good uh, intra, uh, occlusion, uh, a, a, a compromised finish, but see the external photos. There was good intrusion and retraction with good auto rotation of the mandible. The lower anterior facial height reduced and the lip strain improved. The superimposition shows that there was simultaneous intrusion and retraction and with counterclockwise rotation of the mandible. So the patient, see the um, uh, frontal photo, there was the tooth width ratio was altered. There was severe gingival overgrowth here. And the patient was, was advised gingivectomy, but it was not performed. But does it really matter? Because the smile line is slow. Even if the patient performed a gingivectomy, it will not reflect. So what about stability? Is the result stable? Let's see the post-treatment results, um, uh, 11 months post-surgery. The results remain stable. In fact, the auto rotation improved as the bone remodeling uh, improved. I think so. Uh, the incompetency also a little. The smile improved, and the auto rotation was stable. So, what are the added advantages of counterclockwise rotation of the mandible? 
it improves the airway as it changes the higher position and as the poke for, moves forward, the airway improves. We can use a simple um, what exercise. You tilt the chin down and breathe, tilt the chin up and breathe. That's the difference. When the mandible auto rotates, there will be definitely an improvement in the airway. So what is the effect of auto rotation on TMD? The auto rotation of the mandible will flatten the occlusal plane and improves the stability of the condyles. So what are the learning objectives of this case? So when you use uh, this power chain, most commonly this power chain will get embedded in the, in the soft tissue like this. So what can be done? We can use a long primable hook and place it uh, um, distal to the canine or premolar and pull the e-chain on top of it. So you can avoid that complication using this uh, simple technique. Uh, what are the learning outcomes of a posterior bite turbo? Always use the rule of six. 60 squeezes a day, six times a day. You use a, you give a posterior bite block and ask the patient to squeeze. But it depends on patient compliance. So at least if the molar doesn't intrude, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, control the vertical. And it depends on severe patient compliance. And if done the right way, the muscle always wins. So uh, what is the time to engage second molar? Uh, we, we've emphasized that it is mandatory to in, include second molars in the, the treatment. And what's the time? So here is a case in which the first molar this, and the second molar are in two vertical planes. The second molar is superior to the first molar. So here, if we engage the arch wire uh, on the second molar, the second molar will extrude and the first molar will intrude. In a vertical uh, grower or a patient with a long face syndrome, this will, in, this will uh, 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 deteriorate the vertical. So what to do? You say, uh, discipline cutter, cut the wire. And what to do? So the biomechanics we spoke of, uh, this will intrude the first molar. So after intrusion of the first molar, and when the slot of the first molar levels with that of the second molar, uh, go to a lower dimension wire and then engage the second molars. So what are the learning outcomes with regard to the loss of anterior torque? So if, if, if you notice, uh, the, there is uh, a good amount of anterior tooth loss or the tooth teeth is upright or retroclined, it's always uh, better to use two tats instead of one tat because two tats always maintains the, in, uh, the, the vertical better than one tat. So uh, things should be taken in account about the variation of height of tats because the position of the attachment can vary from patient to patient, from right to left in a single patient. Let's take in account a, a patient, a, a common bimax case we see every day, See the position of the tats. On the left side, the tats were placed a bit low, and on the right side, the tats were placed a bit high. So suppose we don't take into account this thing and, and give a retractive force, we'll be inducing a occlusal cant. So this mechanics is so powerful that it can be used to treat occlusal cant, and it can also be, uh, uh, it can create occlusal cant if so, always, so what to do? So always after placing the tad, use a cheek retractor, come in front of the patient and check the height of the tad from the right and the left. And suppose uh, you, 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 if the height of the gingiva is less on this side and the height of the gingiva is more on this side or the primary stability is not there, we had to relocate the tad. Suppose this happens, the height of the tad varies. So in those mechanics, we can um, alter the height of the uh, crimble hook uh, to maintain the occlusal plane. And in all these cases, always check for a retraction, the occlusal cant every three months. So this is the case, no occlusal cant was produced and a decent result was achieved. So are anterior tats mandatory? So these anterior tats are a big headache, especially the subapical tats, uh, because uh, the, the most difficult part of anterior subapical tats is during the uh, <laughs> removal. So anterior tats always mandatory, not in every case. Like, Let's take into account the classic uh, class two subdivision case, uh, severely applied uh, uh, um, uh, upper anteriors. So even after the severe an, uh, inclination of the upper anteriors, there is talk loss even after incorporating of a, uh, of a root torque in the 1925 wire. So what happens? We can, instead of using a, uh, an anterior tad, we can use 
an intrusive arch suspended from the data. So this works on the same principle as that of a conventional uh, intrusion arch. And see the anterior torque was maintained. And this intrusive arches can be uh, used in any wire. You can, it's better to use in a 1725 PMA or an O18SS, sorry, or O16SS, or even a 1725 knight. It's always better to use on a PMA wire. And it can be used in a variety of options. It can be used as a single point contact, as a two point contact, or as an, or as an asymmetric contact in a case of uh, occlusal canting. So while planning to give this intrusion arch, we should always uh, plan in advance because the, the, the whole of the tag should be oriented well in advance. During the implant placement, the, the whole of the tag, we should place it along the direction the wire leaves the tag because after one or two months, we cannot change the position. And if you change the position after one or two months, the tags may fail. As a majority of the tags we use have a clockwise uh, uh, threaded, uh, uh, clockwise threads in a clockwise direction, there is always an unwinding moment on one side. So uh, the idea is use light force not exceeding the unwinding moment and uh, you should always check for the primary stability after two to three months and if the, uh, the tats are very stable we can uh, get a result but the ideal way to use this um, uh, intrusive arch is use a counterclockwise threaded screw it is available from certain manufacturers or use a torque screw so this is an example of a torque screw wherein there is a slot uh, 1925 slot uh, uh, milled into the uh, implant and this is a case of canine extrusion, impaction of canine uh, done with an extrusive arch. So to conclude, can is uh, distalization contraindicated in vertical growth? Because in classic literature, we, we, we are um, uh, taught that we should not distalize in a vertical grower. So TAD, the answer lies in the biomechanics of TAD-assisted distalization. So taking into account the first case, here is a case of TAD-assisted distalization used uh, with an open coil spring. So here, what happens? Here, the, the molars, the first molar will distalize and extrudes the classic approach, what we do with the pendulum appliance. Uh, taking into account the second case, an end molar relation, you uh, distalize with a, a sliding jig. So, it also, it also follows the same principle, this lies with extrusion of the first molar. So in these two patients, the distalization is contraindicated if it is a vertical grower. And we can get away in growing patients as the ramus height is compensated. But what we are talking about is this mechanics, this simple mechanics, which will simultaneously dislice and intrude the arches and it will cause auto rotation. Although the end mass visualization is a different topic, it works on the same principle. So uh, the contraindication becomes a contraindication if we use this mechanics. So what is uh, this mechanics? It's a simple and powerful tool. If used in the right way, using the right mechanics on the right patient. And if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a male. So each problem, each cases should be individualized and the treatment plan should be individualized. And thank you all for your patient hearing. I thank IOS and KOSD for giving me an opportunity to present uh, this webinar. I thank uh, Dr. Uh, Sri Devi ma'am, Dr. Silju Matthew, uh, Dr. Shobha ma'am, Dr. Uh, Pr uh, Prashant sir, uh, Hashim sir and um, uh, Deepu sir for uh, uh, being the panelist. I thank all my patients for giving me, for trusting me uh, and all the clinicians out there who gave me an opportunity and freedom to work with these cases. As I don't have a, uh, a private practice, all these cases were done in uh, visiting consultations. And thank you and happy Independence Day and Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Ijaz for an excellent presentation. You are really pushing the envelope respecting the anatomic boundaries. I think we have a few, a few questions. Uh, one is from Dr. Kavida Ayer. Uh, 
she is asking what is the what was the retention plan for your second case i am not sure what is uh, ma'am actually there was uh, the retention plan was i maintained the buy turbos for a certain period of time and then conventional backside apron retainer in the upper and lower uh, and night and there there was no no much uh, the, than the conventional retention the buy turbos were maintained for uh, six months after that i removed and uh, the the clock the improvement in the, the clockwise rotation of the mandible uh, seen after 11 months maybe due to the removal of the positive pipe turbos the patients will the masticatory uh, the, the the muscles will improvise and the condyle uh, as the condyle gets in the stable position this vertical changes will be stabilized okay there's one more question from dr alvin cletus is asking whether in the first case uh what was the status of the third molars were they extracted or not so the third molars were impacted uh, and uh, it was recommended for extractions but uh, the patient did not go uh, third molar extractions so the posterior discrepancy is very critical and we should always take into account the posterior discrepancy but somehow this case didn't take the uh, lower third molars low upper and the lower third molars but somehow uh, we got away with it but always always recommended to extract third molars and alleviate the posterior discrepancy so oh. so that finishes the question and answer session uh, thank you once again dr ijaz for a wonderful presentation thank you sir uh, so that uh, we have come to the end of our uh, webinar orthodontic summit now uh, i would like to thank all the participants who have attended this webinar for their support and active presence in this webinar and i thank the ios office for providing all the immense technical support required in conducting this webinar i thank uh, dr sridevi padmanabhan uh, the honorable secretary and uh, dr silji mathi sir once again uh, for providing the zoom platform the uninterrupted zoom platform for uh, conducting this webinar thank you sir thank you madam thank you so much thank you good day to all okay thank so you can, have a great day can we conclude the can we close the session yes please thank you all once again have a good happy independence day Thank you all.